So I get to present after Rob Wolf or Chris uh, Master John, so CMJ, and it's going to be a tough show to follow. Uh, so my plan, uh, my, this plan talk, I've been doing some research on botanicals for uh, about three years. I started at Naturopathic Medical School. I went to uh, a little, little tiny conference in Texas called Paleo FX, and uh, Rob Wolf and Mark Sisson went on stage and said, it's your turn, guys. So I want to challenge you guys that if you guys are interested in, in furthering this ancestral movement, it's your turn. So uh, let's try to get this information to as many people as we can. And hopefully one day uh, we can just change the world. But about a, a year ago, uh, I was approached by Tony Federico and uh, J. Uh, Brett Smith and uh, Tara and, uh, sorry, Amber and Nick. We were part of a little podcast and the podcast was called Our Plants Paleo. Should we even be eating plants? Now, it sounds a little uh, provocative, but I'm going to uh, try to dispel some myths because there's a lot of memes out there and we often feel that plants are here for us. You know, like the children of the forest in Game of Thrones. You know, they're just here to provide us with these nutrients and this uh, phytochemical in order to make us healthier. And uh, I want to challenge you to maybe think of plants not here for us, but here for themselves and trying to evolve just like we're trying to evolving and trying to connect to their environment and avoiding the mismatch that they, plants are presented. So in this presentation, we're going to cover the mechanisms of evolution of plants. Then we're going to talk about how these mechanisms of evolution make plants more adapted to their environments. Uh, and then how can we take and investigate these mechanisms of evolution and do something really cool and create new medicine? If you are in the ancestral movement, if you are in the paleo movement, and you're not using botanical medicine, you need to start using botanical medicine because it's so exciting, it's so uh, useful, and it's going to, in the future, in the very near future, it might be one of the, uh, the ways that we're going to save this world. Um, and then finally, not only using this botanical medicine, but also respecting botanical medicine uh, and understanding that not just because it's natural, it's uh, uh, safe for us. I want to start uh, this presentation with a little story. So uh, as you might know, Venezuela is suffering uh, an economic collapse. And within this economic collapse, there's hyperinflation. And with this hyperinflation, people are basically not able to buy. They have stacks and stacks of paper, of worthless paper money that they cannot exchange for sustenance. So people have, a couple, have uh, resorted to foraging. And when they go out and uh, forage, they might encounter uh, that root vegetable right there uh, that's actually bitter yucca. Uh, and it's a close relative to the uh, starchy staple yucca. The difference is that bitter yucca has enormous amounts of cyanide. And when people find this, they're hungry, they take it home, they can't, it's really difficult to differentiate between the bitter yucca and the bitter yucca, and they end up consuming it, and then they die. And the reason, uh, now, bitter yucca can be used to make different types of breads, but it has to be properly prepared. And there are uh, bakeries and uh, specialty shops that specialize in processing this bitter yucca. But if you, to, to the untrained eye, and someone doesn't understand the difference, uh, they can't poison themselves. Why is bitter yucca being so mean to us? Well, this plant is creating this compound or, or, uh, or harnessing this compound and, and concentrating it to defend itself. It puts it into the environment and it prevents, it deters people or uh, animals from eating this root. And imagine, you know, all your genetic information is in the plant, 
Ha have you guys ever seen a plant get up and leave, you know, away from the predator? You can't. So you have to create, you have to adapt. So these plants with these toxic compounds are in fact adapted for survival. I'm going to show you another plant that uses this strategy too. Uh, this right here is the tobacco plant. <laughs> and uh, it produces this really cool alkaloid called nicotine. And <laughs> nicotine, it, it, you know, it's actually insecticide. You know, it kills insects. So it's really good at creating this. You know, it defends itself from, uh, from predators by producing this insect insecticide. Uh, but it also deters pollinators. So you, you are so good at creating this little alkaloid that even the people, you know, the, the little bugs that help you reproduce are deterred. They walk away and, uh, and now you're not pollinating, uh, you're not being pollinated. So it has developed two different strategies. It actually, in the past, you know, maybe thousands of years, it evolved the ability to self-pollinate because there weren't enough pollinators to help uh, uh, pollinate the plant. So it actually became a self-pollinator. And then this alkaloid, maybe in higher order organisms, um, is able to use this alkaloid, not as an insecticide, but with pretty cool effects, you know, positive effects. It's a parasympathomimetic, meaning there's, uh, you know, there's not a lot of chemicals out there that induce a parasympathetic response, and nicotine is one of them. It is very addictive, you know, and there's stories about uh, different higher order uh, animals uh, coming in and using this plant because it's just, you know, they can't get enough of this nicotine. Uh, I've heard stories about deer seeking uh, tobacco plants, but I couldn't find anything on the literature about deer, you know, kind of taking care of this plant in order to help it grow. But I'm sure you're familiar with this higher uh, end animal being able to pamper this plant in order to help it reproduce. So who is controlling who? Is this plant actually creating this alkaloid for itself or for us? Now, it might sound a little bit crazy, but I'm going to show you another example of another alkaloid that we value. Uh, who's familiar, uh, familiar with coffee? So that's another alkaloid uh, that, is, that has this positive effects. You know, uh, if you're not familiar with caffeine, maybe uh, you should, you're at the wrong conference. Uh, <laughs> but this caffeine thing, you know, it, it, it gives you jittery, you know, and it gives you a little bit of energy, and it feels good, tastes super good, a little bit bitter. It acts as an insecticide. It deters uh, predators. It, when, the bee, when, when the berry falls into the ground, it kind of like scorches the ground and nothing else can grow in it. So it's actually protecting itself by creating these alkaloids. Now, I'm going to show you another plant that creates the same alkaloid. Uh, this is the cocoa plant. Now, what's interesting is that this is another plant that has convinced us to pamper it. And it creates the same uh, chemical structure by a completely different mechanism. There's about 12 different ways that a plant can create caffeine. And Camellia sinensis, which is tea, uh, the cocoa plant and the coffee plant, all three of them create the same molecule in different ways. So it's strong this uh, insecticide repellent attractant for other species in order to help itself evolve, to, to uh, adapt to its environment. Now, I can talk about alkaloids all day long, but, but something that interests me more than nicotine and caffeine is actually carnivorous plants. Uh, and Charles Darwin, you know, uh, said that they are the most wonderful plants in the world. This, this is a whole subgenera of the plantae kingdom that was vegan and decided to become carnivorous. <laughs> so <laughs> this, the, the Circinia purpurea grows in the uh, northeastern part of the United States in uh, land that is very low in nitrogen. And it has evolved the ability to digest 
digest bugs in order to incorporate that nitrogen into its genome. How cool is that? You know, this is a plant that, on the face of adversity, developed the machinery to be able to digest proteins. Um, and my, my lab actually became, uh, I work for a lab that focuses on the pox virus in, uh, at the university, uh, at the Arizona State University. Um, and we had, this is before my time, before I started working there, they had no idea about botanical medicine or hippie medicine. You know, they just wanted to know how to control the pox virus. And we came across this paper from the 1800s on the Lancet and it focused on the Mi'kmaq Indians, and there was an outbreak of pox, of a pox infection. And on this article from the 1800s, this, the, this uh, tribe was able to control the outbreak of pox virus using a decoction of this plant, Sarsenia purpurea. So now, this is the, the fork where traditional medicine meets with you know our scientific methods so my lab decided to test if this is possible what we have here is some uh, healthy cells and you can see they're nice and uh, rounded and they're close to each other and they're growing nice this is an in vitro assay and we decided you know this is a, the, the assay that we use over and over when we're testing botanicals or when we're testing new interventions so what happens if you add some pox virus to this assay? You can see how they're bubbling up. This is a film of cells, and as they die, they, they uh, go uh, away from the, the, the Petri dish, and they bubble up, and then they apoptose, and they die. Okay? But what happens if we add the botanical? When you add the botanical, Cersenia purpurea, the cells survive. Whoa. Okay, so it worked. And it led to the writing of this publication. The use of a uh, traditional method of, of medicine to uh, eradicate or prevent uh, pox infections. Um, so after this paper was written, this, uh, this whole lab has created a whole section of botanical medicine studies in conjunction with the uh, Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine. And that's when I became involved in this, uh, in this research. But um, why does this happen? Why is Cersenia purpurea so good at killing viruses? Well, it's a really cool story, actually. Imagine you are a little bug, and you're like floating around, landing in you know different types of plants and uh you're going around and then you eventually land on your uh on the sarsenia purpurea on the pitcher plant and you're carrying some bugs and viruses now if this plant is going to eat you it's also eating this viruses and this bacteria and this uh and this bad stuff so in essence this plant had to evolve the mechanism, the endogenous substances to survive this viral infections. This plant is not giving us free medicine. This plant is protecting itself for survival. And we wanted to test this hypothesis. So remember um, when we were talking about forks, you know, uh, this, so what we decided to do was look at the family of carnivorous plants and how they have evolved over different uh, periods of time and look for the intersection when the plant was vegan and decided to become carnivorous. Uh, and that happens around here. You can see Sarsenia purpurea right there. And then uh, the, the different family that di didn't become carnivorous is over here. And we decided to test this plant against viral activity. And this is what we found out. So that's section we tested the, the non carnivorous and we did this the, you know this is way uh, we did hundreds of experiments I'm just showing you like a snapshot we did it over and over and over and over and what we found out is that in every case if the plant did not become carnivorous it does not have the ability to kill the virus 
So only the carnivorous plants have these endogenous substances. And that's super cool, because if we can, if we can use this evolutionary thinking, we can trace back the, uh, how these plants have evolved, and then we can look at ways of using these plants to our advantage. Uh, but we didn't stop there. We wanted to see how wide we could use this plant, and we decided to test it against a bunch of viruses. And of course, it didn't work uh, because uh, this is not a panacea of health. And we found out that these viruses have, uh, Sersenia has no activity against this type of viruses. But it did have very good activity against some DNA viruses. And we wanted to see what is the common denominator between these viruses that is allowing Sersenia purpurea to prevent their replication. What we found out is that the smallpox virus all require CDK cyclic cyclinases. So if this is we can use thinking this hypothesis to try to figure out what other viruses can Sersenia purpurea be helpful at prospective thinking rather than retrospective. So another virus that has CDK activity is the HIV virus. So we decided to test it. And this is what we found. So if you use Sersenia purpurea against HIV, so we use a, a tincture. A tincture is a decoction of the plant material using ethanol. If we use just the driver, well, this is the blue lines, nothing happens at any concentration. But if you use incremental uh, uh, doses of appropriate decoction, you can see a decrease in the viral load. So we were able to predict that Sersenia purpurea was going to be effective against HIV because we knew the evolutionary between those viruses. So what's happening? What happens is the HIV virus comes in and over phosphorylates with the production of that virus over and over and over and over and over. What Sersenia purpurea is doing is it blocks the CDK and it allows and it actually uh, stops the viral replication. This is super interesting because it creates a new way of combating virus, a way that doesn't require you to suppress the immune system. Okay. So, Super exciting news, you know, we know that uh, Sersenia works on CDK and we can uh, kind of estimate mechanisms of action on different plants and we can use, uh, what else can we do with this information? Well, we know that uh, Sersenia purpurea is really good at inhibiting viral affected cells, such as papilloma uh, cells. And, uh, and the same in vitro experiment, unaffected cells, you know, uh, papilloma, makes you replicate faster parts and you know, ugly things. If you uh, infect with papilloma, the cells apoptose. If you use papilloma and Sersenia, uh, it, it, uh, the papilloma and Sersenia, the Sersenia uh, blocks the papilloma virus and the cells survive. This is a type of oncovirus. And something funny about oncoviruses is that they come into the cell, they use up the machinery, they mutate the cell, the virus leaves, and that is mutated. So the machinery is left behind, the cell and that's how these viruses can cause different tumors, you know, or, or growth. So we wanted to see if Sersenia purpurea against virally transformed cells. So the virus is gone, is Sersenia purpurea able to come in and help these cells uh, basically go into apoptosis? And this is what we found out. Uh, this is a little bit more confusing. This is the Petri dish when we start on day one. We put cells because by day six, these are transformed cells and they're basically the uh, process of cancer. And they don't keep fighting and they just keep growing and growing and growing. If we had incremental amounts of Sersenia purpurea in, uh, in, uh, against the, the vehicle, you can see, we see a reduction in re the reproduction cycle of the cells, which is good. Sersenia purpurea works on transformed cells. 
So uh, I have a couple of uh, close-up shots. Uh, shots. Uh, you can see these are the cells. You know, they, they look nice and uh, elongated. If you put a little bit of Cersenia, you can see them getting a like, little bit of toxicity. If you put a lot of Cersenia, they apoptose and die. And uh, this, is, uh, this is a very cool uh, way of addressing this, this disease process because Cersenia purpurea is going to affect preferentially those cells that are transformed because they're reproducing faster. So it's a, a very surgical approach. Uh, you can see how the cells, they fall and they just die. Um, now, uh, uh, we get a lot of uh, uh, crap, you know, about in vitro experiments. Oh, this is in vitro. Can you transfer it to humans? Well, it turns out that in vitro experiments are a really good primer for topical applications. And it, so, it just so happens that the uh, uh, papilloma causes cervical cancer, and the cervix is it's a good way of testing this hypothesis. So we actually did case studies where we used an application of Cersenia purpurea over the cervix. So this, these are people that were diagnosed with uh, CIN1 or another you know, type of abnormal growth of cells on the skin. And uh, the, the way that, uh, that it works is if you, if you get an abnormal pap smear, you know, where they find abnormal cells, uh, they, they do the pap smear and then they make you wait for the time before you either get uh, a colposcopy or you, uh, you repeat the, uh, the, the uh, pap smear. Uh, so in that wait period, we decided to try to use this um, uh, Cersenia purpurea to see if we could reverse those cells. And uh, we did. We were able to reverse those cases. So in the case of topical applications, there is, uh, we can reproduce the results and Cersenia purpurea could be a very good way of fighting this type of disease. Uh, now, uh, we, can, uh, we can talk about uh, other types of uh, uh, disease processes. Uh, for example, Epstein-Barr CDKs. Um, cancer, all of them depend on so, but also more like processes, and we don't have the pharma, uh, pharmacokinetics. But we so, uh, in uh, there's papers um, about uh, the the number one concern for the world uh, in 2050 uh, in 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 the health is not going to be autism. It's not going to be cancer. It's not going to be uh, you know uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, it's not going to be gluten sensitivities. It's going to be uh, because we are using up our antibiotics. We, uh, we have abused them, and uh, we etch uh, my uh, released at the Journal of Evolution is uh, bacterial botanicals. We were able to create bacterial resistance using botanicals. And it's scary that with and the promotion of, of uh, plant uh, antibiotics or antimicrobials, that we might not be using them judiciously. So 
to make sure that able to uh, not make the same mistakes that we made with the uh, And so we have to respect them. Uh, just to this at all of the Um, and, uh, but money and, and really uh, try to advance botanical medicine because the answer is out there. Just think about how many plants we know and how many plants we don't know and how we could harness their mechanisms to fight infections. Um, if you are interested in botanical medicine, a good step into starting a botanical medicine at your house uh, with the help of uh, Tiffany Turner and uh, Billy Mitchell we created an ebook called uh, the top medical uh, it's it, it in case there's a an oops moment you can use this natural um, supplementations to uh, get away from maybe using too many pharmaceuticals but it's a using uh, some uh, botanical medicine and uh, and if you haven't please download my podcast the 30 30 health show uh, and uh, that concludes my presentation do you guys have any questions <laughs> yeah uh, the microphone if, if you have a question could you could you go to the microphone and yes Uh, this mic's not, oh, there we go. Okay, so if anybody wants, the microphone's live now if you want to come ask questions here. Guillermo, thank you. That was pretty wonderful, um, especially for someone who I'm only used to using metronidazole and, and drugs. So I um, was curious, you bring up this concept, and I, I don't know, mechanistically, thank you, my, my back loves that. Um, I'm like sitting here in the back thinking, do these plants have immune systems? Oh, it, so my <laughs> Langland actually did part of the of humans. It's, it, you know, it's, it, you know I, I, I was talking to Steph Pro and, uh, and she did a course plant physiology, and she was kind of like upset that she had ended up in this course. And after the course was done, she just loves plants because they are so, uh, just imagine, you know, we think that uh, we look at plants and they just sit there and, and we think, you know, oh, it's just a plant. But uh, a good analogy that I heard from Diana Rogers is that imagine if like there were aliens that are moving like closer to, this, to the speed of light and they're looking at us and we're like barely moving to them. So we're like really boring organisms. It, it's the same way, you know, plants have communication, have immune systems and have all this, you know, uh, adaptive responses just like we do. All right, I think that's gonna be your presentation next year. Is the, <laughs> just saying. Thank you, Dr. Abbott. Thank you, that was fascinating. At one point, you mentioned, I think, how you made an evolutionary connection between a certain plant and a certain virus. And I completely missed that, how you did that. I was wondering if you could say that again. OK, so uh, th that's the intersection of like your traditional methods of medicine. The, lo the loss of similars, you know, like, oh, this thankfully with science, we can test that. And it turns out that maybe by chance, you know, someone did think that, you know, 
and I take it from along. And then, you know, thousands of years of trial and error, uh, then we actually uh, along. But the, the way we, we made that connection was because of that 1800s paper that oh. where the Mi'kmaq Indians were using this plant traditionally for this, ta this type of uh, skin eruption. So we just decided to test it, yeah. I see, okay, thank you, thank you. Hi, Marty. Hey, Guillermo, uh, loved your talk. Uh, you had put together um, like 30 different medicinal plants that are helpful, and uh, which reminded me, it is a, a terrible thing that uh, you're talking about, so many of us are talking about, about the problems with antibiotics and bacterial problems that are on the horizon. What are like the three things we can do uh, with kind of a paleo or ancestral template that we can do to strengthen our bodies so that we don't fall prey to a lot of the problems that are coming up? And I suspect some of those 30 items are your like top three things we could do. Well, you know, uh, Using an evolutionary approach to uh, eating, to take away, you know, things that we do, other than breathing, you know, that's the most, probably the most oxidative thing we do. Eating would be like number two. Uh, and eating a uh, less inflammatory diet to try to, you know, move up, that your immune system doesn't have to concentrate on, you know, bad stuff and, you know, lay, you know, laying low and then concentrating like things and more important things like cancer. Uh, it, it would be useful to eat a better diet just for immune system concerns, you know. Uh, and then uh, it, 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 tale, you know, it, just respecting the plants. Uh, uh, I really shy away people not going to a practitioner when they have an infection, they just go into their uh, local health food store and just buying whatever combination of antimicrobial and then using it. You wouldn't do that. And it turns out that a lot of these antimicrobials have structures really similar to pharmaceutical antibiotics. And uh, that's a story that's developing and I have a couple of papers that we're gonna publish in the very near future making a very clear uh, uh, case for that. So uh, just like we are scared of penicillin, you know, we should be scared of antimicrobials. And then thirdly, you know, uh, a really cool thing that we found out, you know, is that if you have a cough, uh, we found this uh, double blind placebo controlled trial in humans where instant coffee with honey was more effective treat, uh, at treating a cough than dexamethasone, than steroids. So how cool that you can use some coffee instead of using steroids for your cough, you know, and something that's tasty and it, you know, so, it, you know, just investigating and, and not being scared of, of using, but uh, being very careful and having respect for them. That reminded me, and one of my big things that has come up for me is recognizing the problems that fluoroquinolones have. Yes. Uh, and it's we're just more people are beginning to realize. Oh, just uh, wait until the papers drop. It's going to make people oh, like, ooh. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Guillermo, awesome talk. Hey, Keith. <laughs> hey. So as someone who is part of the evil empire in my previous life, and that is the pharmaceutical industry, how concerned are you that the pharmaceutical industry is going to swoop in and co-opt some of these? And it, I mean, and is it even a concern? Well, or would it be beneficial even? Okay, so really funny story. You know, I've gone, you know, across the ocean to present this research. And the NIH and the come up to us and they're super excited, just like you guys, and they're like, dude, this is awesome. Whenever you purify it and you make it into a pharmacologic, you call us and then we'll fund you. No one has any interest in working with plants and you can have, you know, there's many reasons, you know, uh, a, a little tagline that I like to say is that it's hard to patent a plant. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Ab has, okay, so we do use botanicals, we do put evidence behind them, but now we're going towards trying to isolate the active constituent 
and creating pharma, uh, pharmaceuticals out of them because there is no money. And unless we pass the hat around in crowds like this, this stuff is not going to get funded. Uh, it has its advantages because, uh, for example, when you, when you standardize it and you purify it, it's going to be way more effective. These are organic materials that change from season to season. So we somehow. So being able to do those things are important uh, for uh, consistency in treatment. But at the same time, once you purify something and you, and you uh, get it to the uh, least common denominator, now there is a chance of creating, um, of creating resistance. Because viruses can create resistance just like bacteria. The advantage of using is that if you use this strategy of using uh, evolutionary theory to try to figure out mechanisms of action, now you can create synergistic blends with different botanicals that act on viral activity from different points, and now you have less of a chance of creating resistance. For example, you can have a plant that is directly antiviral, and then you can have a plant like echinacea that it elevates your immune system of action that are acting in completely different ways but are truly synergistic. If we investigate this mechanism of action and we find two plants that are act on the same mechanism of action, then uh, we try to avoid combining them two because you're just repeating the same process and the chances of, uh, of becoming resistance elevate. So I, an, an easiest strategy without having to go into a lab and creating your own tinctures and in vitro experiments, just think about that fork where plants uh, uh, grew apart. If you, uh, if you are making an antiviral tincture with something like Sarsenia, don't put another, put someone from the Asteraceae family, someone from the Lamiaceae family, because chances are that their adaptive mechanism is completely different than that of the first plant. But yeah, it is, it is. Great talk. So your focus was on. Or whatever. Induce upregulation of our phase one and phase two antioxidant enzymes and can promote better, you know, immune health and de detoxification processes. Have you some thoughts on that? And does your lab look at that kind of interaction? Um, you know, uh, we are a nature uh, traditional methods. So we do look at, okay, what is good against killing staph? We ask a hundred herbs, test them, and we figure out. Uh, so we're not doing anything, but yeah, I do agree. Uh, like, for example, uh, milk help with liver detoxification. It's, it's liver and better. Uh, so, yeah, these phytochemicals have this almost like little toxic effect. And if it can, it can add, add, and add, and if you break that camel's back, you're going to get into big trouble. So if you, if you have, if you accidentally took too much Tylenol and you have liver toxicity, do not take milk thistle because it might just ruin you completely. Uh, so we, yeah, but it, it, it is a positive stressor. Okay, we'll follow up with the last question. Uh, it's a comparative question. I'm a comparative scientist, so it's going to sound very odd to many people here probably. But can a carnivorous plant be wired to eat? Bouncing off of Rob Wolf's talk. In the sense that do they have decision-making processes about diet, uh, the insect component of their diet? You know, I, uh, I've heard of things where like uh, 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 oak trees, I think, they create different uh, chemicals to, you know, scare away beetles and stuff like that. So I can imagine that these different plants have a preferred diet, and they probably do create new uh, endogenous substances to attract different, different. so it, it's not completely implausible. It would be interesting to create a plant that became obese or metabolically broken <laughs> yeah. by giving it a hyper-palatable <laughs> diet, and they can't say no to foods. And then... As, an evolu as a model, you and know, to test we, the principles that we're talking about here. And then I would tell that plant, you need to stop eating gluten plants. Yes, everything in moderation. <laughs> yeah. 
All right, thank you. Let's put our hands together for Guillermo. Thank you so much.